So good afternoon, everybody. We have a few announcements to get through, but I want to start, first of all, by expressing our personal gratitude to the people of Massachusetts for their patience, their perseverance, and diligence during these very challenging times. It's an understatement to say that we are in uncharted waters, and we know the extraordinary steps we've been taking uh, and the impact that we're placing and will continue to place on many of our citizens. But we are humbled by the daily creativity and resiliency that we see from the people of this remarkable state. And our admiration over the past two weeks has only grown. Without question, we are likely to have some very tough days ahead of us as we are still at the beginning of this battle against this virus. But we continue to have great faith and confidence that we will get through this by pulling together, caring for one another, and doing what's right for our neighbors and our communities, because that is who we are. When we have taken unprecedented and strong action, I want to address the ongoing rumors about a possible order to shelter in place. I've spoke about this before, but let me be clear, we are not planning any shelter in place orders. In times of crisis, it's imperative that everyone get their news from legitimate places, and sometimes that's not from your friends, 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 neighbor. We urge all citizens to please bookmark mass.gov slash COVID-19 and regularly check there for any and all updates. And keep in mind, again, that for the vast majority of people, approximately 80% of the population, COVID-19 would mostly feel like the flu. The infection would not lead to hospitalization. Your body fights the infection and you recover. But the reason we're taking this so seriously is because of it is, it is incredibly contagious. It's a lot more contagious than the regular flu. There will certainly be more cases of COVID-19 here in Massachusetts, but we also know that if we take decisive steps now and everyone plays their part by following the best medical guidance, we can slow down the spread. And our healthcare system will be better positioned to care for the people who really need it. With that said, today we're announcing several new elements and initiatives. First of all, our administration through the command center will be distributing a down payment of $5 million in emergency funds to local boards of health across the Commonwealth. That money will go out today and more will follow soon. I signed this appropriation into law after it was allotted by the legislature at the end of last week to address the immediate needs of our community health boards in addressing COVID-19. Most of this funny money will go directly to our cities and towns to help them respond to this public health emergency. We also plan to execute emergency contracts with our cities and health districts that have sufficient capacity to receive and utilize funding and will continue to move through this process quickly. Our largest municipalities, which have over 70,000 residents or more, and our public health districts will receive contracts today. Other local boards of health will receive more information from DPH today. And in addition to providing funding for municipalities, we're also extending our reach to offer support where needed to cities and towns. We also signed two emergency orders and the Commissioner of Public Health has issued two orders as well to expedite the onboarding of more licensed healthcare professionals. These orders will make it easier for licensed healthcare staff including registered nurses, licensed practical nurses, and respiratory technicians to work at another licensed facility. These orders will cut red tape so hospitals can staff up faster. This will also allow out-of-state licensed physicians in good standing to practice in Massachusetts and enable retired physicians in good standing to reactivate their license. Again, this is all about helping to expand our healthcare delivery capacity. Recognizing the crucial need for sufficient EMS capacity during this public health emergency, these orders also adjust minimum standards for ambulance staffing to ensure sufficient availability and capacity of EMS services. And finally, these orders will also facilitate telehealth across state lines. This builds off the emergency order we issued on Sunday 
for all commercial health insurance carriers to allow providers to provide services via telehealth. What this means is that by working with their health care provider, patients can talk to their doctors via video or phone so they do not have to visit a doctor's office. The significant measures we've taken in the past few days will help mitigate the spread of COVID-19, but there is no denying that this causes major, major disruption for economic sector and especially the Commonwealth small business community. Yesterday, we announced economic support for small businesses with a $10 million loan fund to provide financial relief. But it's crucial we bring every resource to bear to address the economic disruption caused by COVID-19, including those available from the federal government. I was glad to see the feds talking earlier today about a major recovery package. Last Thursday, MEMA took the first step in the process of securing relief from the Federal Small Business Administration, conducting a survey to identify businesses affected by the COVID-19 outbreak. Today, I am formally requesting that the Small Business Administration issue a declaration of economic injury for the Commonwealth. This declaration would make it possible for low interest loans to be made available to business owners affected by the outbreak of COVID-19. Everybody knows the economic disruption is real, but we are committed to pursuing a variety of solutions to help mitigate these effects. It's my hope and expectation that both the state and federal government will have more to say about this effort as time goes on so that we can help as many people as possible recover from the widespread impacts of this disease. As a reminder, we've also taken the following steps over the past couple of days. We're relaxing some of the requirements around current unemployment claims. This will allow many of the workers affected by closures to get some financial relief. We filed emergency legislation with the legislature that will allow new claims to be paid more quickly by waiving the one-week waiting period for unemployment be benefits. And we met with the legislative leadership yesterday to discuss this and several other short-term issues. I look forward to working with them to get these measures passed as soon as possible. On Sunday, we also instructed all non-emergency state employees from the executive branch not to report to work yesterday and today unless they were essential to the state's COVID-19 response efforts. Over the past few days, we've had productive talks with the unions and leadership across our agencies, and later today, we'll be rolling out updated information and guidance for executive branch employees around telework and what they should expect going forward. I want to say at this time that I really appreciate the level of effort and the commitment and the cooperation that so many people put in on this one over the past 48 hours. And I think as many people know, effective today, bars and restaurants in Massachusetts that offer food and drink shall not offer on-premises consumption. These establishments may continue to offer food for takeout and delivery. This order is in effect for the next three weeks. And it's important to note that this order does not apply to grocery stores, retail outlets, or pharmacies. This is about bars and restaurants and those places that people do not absolutely have to go to. Many folks have noticed grocery store shelves seem bare. The reason for this is because people are perhaps going a little overboard to stock up on supplies. Please use common sense and moderation and avoid hoarding large quantities. The shelves are getting restocked pretty much every night. And for responsible planning advice, you can always visit mass.gov slash no plan and prepare. On a final note, I want to thank everyone again for their patience and perseverance during these unprecedented and difficult times. Your cooperation and diligence are vital to keeping you, your family, your neighbors, and our community safe. And I'm confident that we're going to get through this together. I would also like to ask everyone to remember the most vulnerable among us and ask that you reach out and help if you can. I know there are programs that are being put up in communities all over the Commonwealth, which comes as no surprise, I think, to any of us. Call your neighbors, your friends, your families. A check-in can go a long way right now in helping someone get through their day. And with that, I want to turn it over to Secretary, actually, Command Center Director Mary Lou Sutters. Your new title. I like Secretary. <laughs> and Command Center. Good afternoon. Last evening, along with Commissioner Burrell, I held a conference call with the Coalition for Local Public Health. 
representing the Massachusetts Association of Public Health Nurses, the Mass Association of Health Boards, the Mass Health Officers Association, the Western Mass Public Health Association, the Mass Environmental Health Association, and the Mass Public Health Association to discuss distribution of the funds appropriated and to lay out our initial planning for our local boards of health. As you heard the governor said, say, we intend to execute emergency contracts to support local boards of health today to the 14 largest municipalities and the 15 Massachusetts public health districts. This represents just about 50% of our state's population. We have a follow-up call today with the group. I asked them to help us to address the needs of the remaining municipalities who do not have the infrastructure and to get them the support they need ASAP. And actually, this is sort of unusual. Usually when you contract in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you put out a bid for proposals and you have to invite back in proposals and then you go through the process of selection. Instead, what we did today was literally email out a short contract, asking them to sign it, send it back to us. We issue the funds today. They're retroactive to the 1st of February and then submit to us um, additional needs that they need. So today was a $5 million down payment for deeds. Let me just quickly address the issue of lab testing. The addition of national lab testing and the changes in clinical protocols is making a difference. And Commissioner Burrell will go over the numbers. Because as you know, clinicians can now send specimens directly to the lab for testing. But as you've heard us often say, we still need more labs approved to test expanding test capacity is critical. The command center has prioritized increasing testing capacity. We are working all avenues to rapidly increase the testing capacity in the face of emerging issues. Earlier today, I connected with two local testing companies, Perkin Elmer and Thermo Fisher, and both have committed to help the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I spoke personally with the CEO of Perkin Elmer and the leadership of Thermo Fisher and just a little while ago with the Broad Institute. A few promising avenues, promising avenues. There will be more to follow. We believe we can establish the Broad Institute as a state reference lab and are working to supply them with Thermo Fisher test kits. If we're successful, the Broad Institute would be able to test almost 1,000 kits per day. The Perkin Elmer CEO has offered to supply the state lab with a testing machine and supplies with additional capacity for almost 1,000 tests per day. And we are matchmaking with between local, whoever thought I'd be a matchmaker, we are matchmaking between local academic medical centers, many of whom have machine capacity, but various supply shortages and testing supplies, including the local companies Thermo Fisher and Perker, Perkin Elmers. Perkin Elmer. This is extraordinarily important to us in order to increase testing capacity across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And with that, I'll turn over to Commissioner Burrell for the latest numbers. Thank you so much, Secretary. Good afternoon, everybody. Many of you might know that I spent a good deal of my career in the healthcare system as a general internal medicine physician in academic hospitals, community health centers, VAs, city hospitals, and other settings. I had a call this morning with hospitals and community health centers across the state to discuss the current updates. I understand the need of our healthcare providers, and I appreciate the urgent needs of our patients and healthcare professionals. I'd like to give a few more details related to the testing that Secretary Sutters mentioned. I want to be clear that our goal in the administration is to continue to increase our testing capability as quickly and as safely as we can. We are working hard to expand both our state and commercial testing capacity in the Commonwealth. Now that the CDC criteria has expanded, it allows us to expand testing capacity as well. But I understand that it is not at the fast pace that we would all prefer. Some of this is due to federal level shortages that Massachusetts and many other states are facing. We are moving as quickly as we can 
And we are doing data integration with our commercial lab partners to make sure that this testing and testing information is compatible with the data that we have at the State Department of Public Health. We want to be absolutely certain that the numbers we are releasing are accurate and timely. With new clinical changes at the CDC, the state lab has the capacity to test 400 patients per day at the state lab, up from 200 patients a day. The state lab, at this time at the state lab, we do have adequate supplies for testing. Now I'd like to um, talk with you for a few minutes about the numbers. Every day we report our Massachusetts case numbers. Those numbers are now at 197 cases. Also import, important to note, all cases that were previously categorized as presumptive positive will now be considered positive. So on our report today, you will see them all listed as confirmed positive cases. Every day we will be reporting our testing numbers as well. As of this morning, our state lab has conducted 1,367 tests from 1,092 tests yesterday. We have over 204 results also reported to us from commercial labs to date. And we will post updated commercial lab numbers later today. Our goal every day is to report out our latest case numbers and testing numbers by 4 p.m. on our website. Our absolute priority is sharing data that is correct, factual, and updated. I want to again take a moment to emphasize the importance of social distancing. The measures we have put in place will not only slow the spread of disease in our communities, but these measures will give us time to build up our healthcare capacity so we can be better prepared to handle the demands that COVID-19 will place on our healthcare system and on our clinicians. As you have heard before, this is referred to as flattening of the curve. The social distancing we are all doing is a way for each one of us to have an impact on the outcome of this disease. And I know it is challenging for your family and mine to do it, but it is critical in assisting us in flattening the curve. Every epidemic has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And while it's sometimes challenging to know where we are in that continuum, everything we're doing today is trying to bring us closer to the end. This response may take longer than any of us want it to, but we will be here for as long as it takes. Questions for any of us? Governor, do you have any ideas about the... Uh,